Most of Quentin Tarantino's new film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is not based on real history, but so many meticulous details in the film are exactly like real life that viewers could be easily confused. Here's how Once Upon a Time in Hollywood lied to you. Major spoilers ahead. Apart from the ending, the biggest lie in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was basically the entire story arc. The film tells the tale of Leonardo DiCaprio's character Rick Dalton, a washed-up cowboy actor who once had his own Western TV show and is now relegated to playing the baddie of the week. It's official, old buddy. Well, it has been. His best friend, handyman, and personal chauffeur is Cliff Booth, played by a weathered-looking Brad Pitt. Both of these characters are fictional, their story is fictional, and their slight connection to Sharon Tate was non-existent, because they were non-existent. And yet, the movie isn't really about Sharon Tate or the Manson family. It's about these two inventions of Quentin Tarantino's mind. The very real characters that occupied Hollywood in the late 1960s are simply woven into Rick and Cliff's fictional narrative, which makes it difficult to sift the reality out of the rest of the story. Cliff, so you still with Rick, huh? Still here. You in there? Yeah, just not. According to Esquire, though, the friendship between Booth and Dalton was loosely based on the relationship between Burt Reynolds and stuntman Hal Needham. Needham, like Pitt's Booth, was tough, loyal, and unflappable. The two even shared a house for five years and, quote, never ever had a cross word. Incidentally, Reynolds would have had a small part in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but he died before his scene could be shot. Since Rick and Cliff weren't real people, it stands to reason that the TV show that made them famous probably wasn't real either. According to Bustle, Bounty Law was invented for the movie, though Tarantino says the fictional series was heavily influenced by a Western television show of the same era called Wanted Dead or Alive. Similarly, the Italian film Kill Me Now Ringo said the gringo, which Rick goes on to star in at the end of the film, was also a fabrication. But not all of the shows featured in the film were made up. The FBI was a real show that ran from 1965 to 1974, and Lancer, the show that Rick Dalton is working on while simultaneously having his midlife crisis, was also real. It's easy to understand that creative choice, because you can't just inject your fictional character into a starring role in a real TV show, but you can give him a guest spot pretty easily. For all of Quentin Tarantino's devotion to the details, he did get something really wrong. According to NPR, 1960s cinematography was not on par with the cinematography of the modern era, but Rick Dalton's guest spot on Lancer was shot in much the same way a filmmaker might shoot a modern movie, with long takes and fancy camera work. In reality, 1960s television was a lot rougher than what were shown in that scene, but Once Upon a Time in Hollywood cinematographer Robert Richardson told IndieWire that the choice was deliberate, so it's not like Tarantino just forgot to watch a few spaghetti westerns before he shot those scenes. Richardson explained, the level of sophistication in the camera moves wouldn't have been done at that time. It's really a Quentin touch. He wanted to make this his next western as a central point. He achieved that goal, but I wouldn't call it a spaghetti western. Of all the Manson family characters depicted in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's the one called Pussycat who is the most fleshed out and most memorable. But the character is really only partially based on a real person. According to Bustle, there was a Manson family member named Kitty Cat who fled the ranch after Manson's arrest and ended up giving investigators crucial information that helped them solve the murders of Sharon Tate and her friends. The real-life Kitty Cat was a different sort of character than Pussycat, though. Pussycat is drinking the Manson family Kool-Aid. She's clearly enamored with Manson and feels right at home on the ranch. Kitty Cat, on the other hand, didn't feel like she belonged with the family and was sometimes at odds with Manson himself. There was a time when she fell asleep during one of his probably boring and narcissistic speeches, and when she woke up, he was punching her in the face. So she was hardly the free spirit that her movie counterpart was, if you can even say that character was intended to be more than just a girl with a similar name. In the film, Rick Dalton lives next door to Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. History mostly remembers Roman Polanski as the guy who did some very bad things and then fled to Paris to avoid punishment. History mostly remembers Sharon Tate as the woman who was brutally murdered by members of the Manson family. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood remembers them differently, as the jet-setting, party-loving couple who sparked envy in DiCaprio's already troubled character. Tate's story is woven into the narrative of the film, and her sister Deborah Tate was evidently so impressed with Margot Robbie's performance 
that she told Vanity Fair she felt like she'd been given a chance to see her sister again. But there were a few underlying details about the Polanski-Tate romance that are missing from the film. That is, if you believe the expose about the couple that was published in 2016. According to Sharon Tate Alive, Polanski was controlling, sometimes cruel, and would often pressure his wife into taking drugs and participating in humiliating adult activities, some of which he filmed and then showed his friends at parties. We don't see that in the film, though, which portrays the romance in a much more innocent light. There are a few fans of Bruce Lee and old martial art films who are unhappy about Bruce Lee's portrayal in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Tarantino's version of Bruce Lee is an arrogant jerk whose kung fu vocalizations sound ridiculous. And what's more, Lee gets taken down by Pitt's clip Booth. And it's not like he gets knocked over a couple of times in an even fight, either. Booth beats the stuffing out of Lee and even tosses him into the side of a perfectly nice car, leaving a Bruce Lee-sized dent. It doesn't seem like anything close to this ever happened in reality. Bruce Lee legend holds that he only ever lost one fight in his whole life, and that was when he was 13 years old. So he certainly wasn't ever defeated by some random washed-up stuntman, though he was rather famously challenged to a fight in 1964 by a guy named Wong Jack Man. According to Mental Floss, Lee and Wong fought for 20 minutes, and the fight ended when Lee got the upper hand and then bystanders stepped in and separated them. The match wasn't a loss for Lee, but it did change the way he fought. He devoted himself to more rigorous training and went on to become a star. A star who never got the stuffing beat out of him by some random stuntman. We get into a fight, I accidentally kill you, I go to jail. Anybody accidentally kills anybody in a fight, they go to jail. It's called manslaughter. The movie ends before the aftermath of the Manson family murders. Well, in this movie, there were no Manson murders, so therefore there could be no aftermath. But it does allude to some of the things that happened after the real-life murders. At first, no one had any idea who might have wanted Sharon Tate and her friends dead, and Polanski was convinced it was someone they knew. For a while, he suspected Bruce Lee. According to Esquire, there was even a rumor that Lee had been with one of the victims, Jay Sebring, on the day of the murders. And once upon a time in Hollywood, we see Lee actually training with Sebring on the day prior to the Manson family's noisy trek up Cielo Drive, but that's all based on an unsubstantiated rumor. There's no evidence that Lee was with Sebring that day. Lee's widow couldn't recall him going there, and there was no note of it in his training logs either. In the film, Polanski and Tate don't just live in Rick Dalton's neighborhood, they're his next-door neighbors. In fact, their houses are so close that Rick has a conversation with Jay Sebring through Tate's security gate while standing in his own driveway. But in real life, the Polanski house was not really close to anything. There was no house right next door to 10050 Cielo Drive, where Polanski and Tate lived in the summer of 1969. According to Helter Skelter, the true story of the Manson murders, Cielo Drive is a narrow, windy road that dead ends at the home, and the house itself is more than 100 feet from the gate where Rick and Jay had their conversation at the end of the film. It's unlikely that anyone in the neighborhood ever heard Sharon Tate play loud music on a warm afternoon because the closest neighbor, at 10070 Cielo, is almost 100 yards away. So Tarantino took some real liberties with the real estate by adding a whole additional house to the neighborhood. There was nothing comical about the murders of Sharon Tate and her friends in the early hours of August 9, 1969, but Quentin Tarantino, being Quentin Tarantino, does love to turn horrible violence into absurd humor. In the film, we see the four murderers ominously walking up the hill, armed with killing tools and ready to carry out Charles Manson's orders. Then one of them, Linda Kasabian, stops walking and tells the others she's left her knife in the car. Moments later, they watch as she peels off in their getaway car. That's fictional, too. According to Bustle, Linda Kasabian didn't participate in the murders, but she didn't run away, either. She drove the Manson family to the crime scene, and then she acted as a lookout. Though after witnessing part of the attacks, she went back down the hill to where the car was parked and waited there while the killers finished the job. Kasabian later served as a prosecution witness and was granted full immunity in exchange for her testimony. Everyone knows how the tragic story really ended. The killers tied up an eight months pregnant Sharon Tate and her friends and stabbed them to death. In Tarantino's fairy tale, the ending is different. The Manson family enters Rick Dalton's house instead of the house at 10050 Cielo Drive. They encounter Cliff Booth, who's just smoked an acid-dipped cigarette and isn't sure if they're real. He recognizes them from their earlier encounter at Spawn Ranch, but he can't recall Tex Watson's name. 
Echoing a line that the real Tex said to Sharon Tate and her friends, according to the LA Times, Tex says, I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. Cliff then replies, nah, it was dumber than that. And then Cliff, his dog, and Rick kill all three of them. It's another example of Tarantino's now famous alternate reality revenge. If only we could go back in time and give the bad guys what they deserve. Then washed up TV cowboys could make friends with Sharon Tate and live happily ever after. Sharon's presence throughout is a nice way, I think, to give her a chance for people to really appreciate the life she lived as opposed to remembering her for her death. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite films are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.